So good morning. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this webinar, which has been kindly put together for us by the team at GTR. Um, today, our intention is really to focus on all things Nordic and trade and consider how that region has been impacted and is responding to um, some of the, the current challenges that we're facing. Um, my name is Matthew Solly. I'm part of the Structured Credit and Political Risk Business at Gallagher, and we've been serving the Nordic region now for more than 15 years um, in an insurance broking capacity. So very happy to be um, taking part in this webinar today. Um, we are delighted to have for you a wealth of expertise. We have representatives both from the commercial and the public sector and also representing risk takers, financiers, the corporate sector, technology. So we've got, we should have all bases covered and hopefully um, plenty of opportunity for some really valuable input. Now, the plan for today is that we're going to have four brief panel sessions. There'll be two panelists on each of those. Um, there'll be a mixture of discussion and a little bit of presentation as well. And each of those is going to just last for 15 minutes. So that will take us up to approximately, approximately, sorry, a full hour. And thereafter, we will move into a period of Q&A. Now, importantly, all of the panelists will be staying for us for the, with us, sorry, for the entirety of the webinar. So what I would encourage you to do, and this brings me to the first point of housekeeping, on your Zoom screens, you should see that there is a Q&A button. So if at any point during this morning's webinar, you wish to submit a question, please do, and I would encourage you to do so. Let's take advantage of having um, these people um, virtually with us today um, and click on that. And the team at GTR will collect those for us and they'll be sending those through to me towards the end of the webinar. And then I'll be asking, you know, directing those questions to the relevant individuals. The second point of um, housekeeping is really just to put um, a couple of dates in your diary um, being the 10th to the 12th of November. Um, that's looking like finalised dates for the GTR Nordic Conference. There will be further announcements coming out, but certainly the plan, as we understand, is that there will be both a virtual um, and a physical, if you like, element to that event. So certainly get those dates marked in your diary. I know from the way things are looking for us, um, there's going to be a limited number of opportunities to travel. So that if that is something you'd like to participate in, um, as I say, get those things marked down nice and early. Um, so with the, with the limited time, I won't um, talk any longer. I'll just introduce our first panel, which is going to be entitled A New World of Risk. Um, we're delighted to welcome Birgitta Lindstrom Crook, who is a director of the structured finance business for large corporates at SEK, and additionally, Patrick Zekar. Patrick is the head of trade and working capital management sales um, for Nordea. So, uh, Birgitta and Patrick, if I could please pass across to you. Thank you very much. Uh, Matthew, and um, yes, let's let's get on to it. I think uh, we will start with you know just giving some some observation on on on, a, on the Nordic uh, general trade perspective uh, since since the start of the COVID situation. Um, uh, saying you know um, early uh, earlier this year, and I, I I need to you know make a reservation. Uh, up front on that, I, I think what we will really see um, be able to make an impact assessment in when we see the Q2 reports, or or we might need even to wait to the Q3 reports coming out here. But if, if I if I go back to you know early January, we already then saw a sl slow pickup on trade, and we didn't really have an explanation on what was going on. We we were expected that. It might be due to year-end shipments, which were performed uh, successfully in December, and a lot of holidays coming up in, in the days. It was in the initial wave of the lockdown in China, which impacted the supply chain for the Nordic industries. We saw shipments being delayed and, 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 and even stuck. And also, you know, activation of companies' contingencies, as well as the bank's contingency plans. And there was, was further examining of sourcing, sourcing options and, and also a planning for, a, for um, the impact of a broader lockdown as well as, as securing liquidity. And, and then I think the, the, um, 
it played out very fast by, you know, by the time the lockdown spreads more broadly, uh, we could see the Nordic governments <clears throat> had or were already in the process of deploying significant support package here. <clears throat> the form of this package may not have been, you know, perfect from the start, but the speed was really critical and essential here to, to reassure the corporates uh, and, and, uh, and populations. And then the last thing, if I take a Nordic perspective here, because we cannot, it was a difference in between the countries. And if you just allow me to do some observation on, on, on country basis, I would say that from Norway, we, we had a severe impact uh, quite, quite early and, and ongoing due to the oil dependent economy there. We could see volumes going up, but that didn't come you know, compensate for the price drop. So uh, severe impact for, for Norway, while Sweden, which is a more industrialized economy uh, and also had a limit, limited lockdown procedures was less affected. And, and, and even in some sectors like pulp paper and, and, and certain type of steels and metals, that was even a positive impact due to that mills in other parts of the world was, was forced to lock down and, 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 and the supply then decreased. Finland, very similar industry infrastructure to Sweden. Those, they were hit by in the service industry and also in machinery and production equipment. Uh, as, as Finland has already entered into a, a, a slow, slow down in the GDP. Um, while if I take Denmark, which is the Example which we see have been uh, most resilient here, um, both due to the largest fiscal easing was made in, in Denmark, but also helped by the uh, industry structure with pharma, wind, food, and agriculture, which contained uh, the downturn uh, in Denmark. And then, then I would like to pass the word over to begin on the export credit uh, side. Thank you, Patrick. And I, I, I now represent more the, the long term transactions. And uh, actually, we within SEK, we've seen a continued request for funding of export transactions. So traditional uh, sovereign infrastructure transactions, they've continued being worked on by exporters, banks, buyers and, and borrowers. So we have not faced less activity, but in the beginning of the crisis, we feared, uh, of course, less activity due to lockdown and also assumed debt relief initiatives. But actually, we see loan agreements being signed, uh, CPs are worked on and activities go on and, and all stakeholders actually work even harder. So all the existing or most of the existing transactions, they, they continue. Maybe we don't see so many new transactions, though. But, but the one we have been working on for, for months or maybe quarters, they, they still continue. Uh, then we've seen an increasing number of investment grade borrowers exploring the ECA route again. And that's as an alternative, of course, to, to more traditional capital financing or capital market financing. Uh, finally, to support uh, sustainable investment is core to, to SEK. And that has become even more in focus the last months. Uh, and but we also see exporters and borrowers, they also add the sustainability perspective on export and investments even more since the crisis started. If that's related to the crisis as such, or if it's more a natural development of where we are on the global level when it comes to our urgent need to really initiate a transition to a lifestyle and economic development that uh, are more sustainable. Well, that's the question. But I think it goes hand in hand. So the crisis has made us stop, stop and uh, reflect seriously in which direction we are heading. And I, I think we've all concluded that we cannot continue as, as we did before. Uh, okay, so that was a comment regarding general trends we've seen. And then I'll kick off next, uh, next uh, topic here on Patrick's and, and my reflection. And that is the challenges we've seen uh, since, since the lockdown started. And uh, within export finance, initially, we of course faced a very volatile market because lenders and borrowers didn't behave as they used to do. 
and we found it increasingly difficult to price transactions due to all the volatility. But that seems to have stabilized now. Then uh, within SEK, of course, we've also seen debt rescheduling within certain sectors, for instance, within aviation. Another challenge we've experienced is, is uh, the lack of PRI cover for tied commercial loans uh, for some transactions in some markets. And that has, has made it more difficult to actually close those transactions that require 100% financing with ECA and PRI cover. Then uh, we are in an industry where we depend on having the ability and possibility to, to meet people, banks, exporters and borrowers. So we try to handle things digitally, but it's not always possible. So especially onboarding new counterparties has become a bit uh, more challenging, I must say. So we would like to work a bit more like we used to do in the, in the old days. So over to you, Patrick, regarding how you view the challenges and also the future. Thank you. Yeah, um, challenges in, 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 if I take the trade, um, um, trade supply chain, it's, it's obviously that we saw some, some, some challenges in, you know, in the resilience, the strains of the resilience in the supply chain. Um, not only the geographical concentration uh, with the risk exposure, which comes with, with, with that, um, in relation to uh, having, you know, too many, um, one, one egg in one basket, to say. Um, but also the, the visibility in the supply chain, which was um, clearly visible where you don't know where you have your supplier supplier and what condition that is. And, 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 and also predicting the demand drop, you know, your buyers, buyers need uh, for, for products and that make it um, very difficult in a stress situation to navigate in, in the dark. Uh, because you need all the parts uh, from the supplier, which are provided by another supplier to the supplier, etc. And when the demand drops suddenly, the, the early signal is very difficult to to um, to assess. Um, the, the the third thing um, I would say was also the vulnerability of the, of the still very paper-based trade process and the lack of uh, of the digitalization there where documents were stuck, stuck in, in, in um, uh, somewhere and not possible to present due to, we had problems with, with the drivers for the courier form, form, which was set in quarantine. So there we couldn't access countries to hand over the documents, et cetera. So what we don't have and what we need to look into is the accessible shared data here uh, in an in a electronic way. And I would say that Nordic are well positioned when it comes to work remotely, but that, that's, that's still a challenge when it comes to international trades um, and you have dependency on, on, on several parties. So if I would say, you know, my future wish list and, and expectation to learn something and, and take something good with, with uh, post-COVID, COVID, I, would, I would say that there will be a continuing discussion around the de-risking of China and, you know, setting the China plus one or even China plus two strategy. Uh, we, we should not, you know, fool ourselves and think that we can avoid China being a gigantic market, but alternatives like Vietnam, Bangladesh, Philippines, etc. are being assessed as a, as a complement. And that, of course, uh, may lead to a, a cost increase, uh, which you have to pay to to, to get that resilience in the supply chain. Uh, the second one is the, uh, I expected to see change of trade patterns and routes, not only due to the um, de-risking, but, but, but also in relation to new trade policies being worked on, uh, especially in the European Union. And on the backdrop of the support packages, uh, countries want to se secure that they um, they protect um, employment, uh, et cetera. So we can see some near shoring. Um, and I, I think we already had uh, some turbulence uh, in the trade uh, cooperation globally before this. And so it will not move uh, 
you know, more openly, but I will expect us to see more protagonism here. The last or second last one is digitalization. I think what we proved during this crisis was that we could handle documents electronically. We were uh, allowed to present electronic uh, ac uh, access documents to the goods, like the Bill of Lading. So it, it's a mindset thing. We now need to industrialize that to get, uh, to take the full step here uh, and become digital in, 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 our, in our trade um, uh, supply chain. Um, the, the last thing I would like to mention is, is possibility here now also to learn to leverage data. Uh, we talked about suppliers, suppliers, and buyers, buyers, data in order to manage your supply chain. Um, I think we can see one tangible exa example with the e-com business directly picking up and uh, to increase uh, resilience in sale, but here we have a lot to do in the supply chain also. And over to you, Birgitta. Okay, so my, my expectations and my, my wish for the future is that the industry will march towards greener and sustainable solutions even faster. And uh, here Swedish exporters have so much to offer and my sincere hope is that Swedish exporters will continue exporting sustainable solutions and concepts. Uh, some transition initiatives need to start in Sweden and those actually SEK can support in financing and they're off to be exporters and other solutions are already out there and I'm thinking in, in, in particular of, of sustainable energy solutions as well as transportation solutions. I think uh, the concept of Team Sweden and the close cooperation between exporters, EKN, SCK and Swedfund can help push more sustainable export globally. And I think we need to be a bit brave and inventive and develop new tools that enhance the development in a greener direction. Then of course the question regarding supply chains and, and how, how global they can be, I think will result in that we do more of regional trade and also use the export finance tool to finance transactions even more in Europe and even in the Nordic region. So to summarize, since I know that time is running out here, is uh, that my hope is uh, that the future post COVID-19 will be a situation where Swedish export financing solutions will support sustainable investments, saving the environment for us and coming generations. Thank you. Thank you. So, Birgitta and Patrick, thank you very much for that. That was a fantastic start and I think a huge amount um, for us to chew on their discussion, the supply side, the buyer side, the financing, technology, sustainability. I'm not sure how you managed to cram all of that into 15 minutes, but very well uh, done for doing so. And I'm sure that there'll be um, a plethora of questions that come off the back of that. Um, we're going to move forward now to our second topic, where we're going to be bringing the export credit agencies into play. And we have a panel title entitled um, Heightened ECA Support Emergency Measures and Medium Term Strategy. Um, we're delighted that today we're able to welcome Marie Aglert, who is a director of large corporates at EKN, and UC Harasilta, who is Executive Vice President for Large, for large Corporates at Vinfera. Both of you, I hope I've done justice to your names and not pronounced anything too incorrectly. Um, I think the plan is for this session, if perhaps, um, Marie, we could come to you first and you might kick us off with the way that EKN has been res responding to the, to the current challenges. Thank you, thank you. And thank you for, for letting me share our EKN's experience. I'm actually calling from Öland in Sweden. I wish I could share the view, it's beautiful here. So, well, uh, anyway, uh, yeah, in mid-March, uh, when we realized the severity of the crisis, uh, we contacted most large corporates in Sweden and banks, and we were also contacted, of course, of, of many of the corporates and banks. And we try to understand the, 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 the need that they um, would foresee for this crisis. And it was quite clear that their worry was the access to liquidity, just like during the financial crisis. So what we did, we um, launched a new product, a similar product, which we also had during the financial crisis, 
a working capital guarantee for large corporates. We cover 75% of the risk uh, with the tenor of up to five years, and we set a limit of 10 billion Swedish crowns per corporate. The interest has been huge, more than we could ever expect. So far, we have received 60 applications from 60 large corporates of an amount of 190 billion Swedish crowns. We are reaching 200 billion Swedish crowns. And what is surprisingly is that initially we thought that the need from the companies were a, a, a reinsurance. We didn't expect them to need the liquidity at the right moment, that moment, rather like a reinsurance that if needed, you can use EKN guarantee. But actually, up to today, we have seen drawdowns from these limits of nearly 50 billion Swedish crowns. So the interest is, is real, for real. What we also have seen is new sectors. Um, for example, for EKN, a new sector is fashion industry. And of course, we have large fashion industry in Sweden with large export activities, and they have been hit severely of the crisis during this crisis. We have also seen the industry of tourism and uh, real estate. So that's, that's very interesting. When it comes to small and medium sized companies, we already had a working capital guarantee product. And what we did was that we increased the coverage ratio to 80%. That means the EKN cover 80%, just to, to um, make sure that the banks would continue to lend to small and medium sized companies. Here, we haven't seen huge interest, um, at least not in the very beginning. It seems like the small and medium sized companies, they rather cut cost in a very tough way and they didn't want to, to lend money. Now we're seeing a shift. So during the last few weeks, I think also when the society is opening up and the business is increasing again, we see um, an increased interest for, for working capital from small and medium sized companies. The second thing we did was that when EU opened up for a market risk, we also opened up for cover for short term risk in the EU and the, in the OECD. So far, we haven't seen a huge interest. There has been a lot, something like 100 applications, but for smaller transactions. But we are expecting that to increase. We also offered um, six month payment holiday for, for existing transactions. Also there, we haven't seen so far such a huge interest. Uh, actually, um, customers around the world are continuing to pay. And fourth, we also, um, we had a digital process uh, internally, which of course has helped us when we work from home, but we also digitalize the process uh, when it comes to signing the offers and the guarantees from a bank's perspective. Lastly, I would like to mention that during this crisis, and we have you know, worked very, very hard uh, with the new products, but as I just want, um, want to emphasize what Birgitta said, export is continuing and export finance is continuing. So if I look at the, the, the business today and compare to last year, we have similar volumes, similar, similar number of transactions, and more or less similar volumes. So, so this has been a very, very challenging time for, for such a small organization as EKN to manage uh, normal business and also the crisis products. That was a short summary from uh, from uh, EKM perspective. Okay, Marie, thank you so much for that. Um, perhaps you see um, we could come to, to you next, if that's okay. Yes, certainly. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to to, to describe a little bit how, how things have uh, and uh, feel that sector is quite well positioned to to support it. One aspect is that Finbra is, uh, is a combination of three mandates. First, we, have a, we are a national promotional bank providing guarantees and loans to Finnish SMEs and mid-cap segment. Uh, and we have approximately 25,000 Finnish SMEs as, as our customers. 
Second, we are, we are the export grade agency and our guarantee portfolio is today 25 billion euros dominated uh, by, by cruise ships, telecoms, pulp and paper, power and, and other sectors. And, and the third analyst is that, that uh, we also provide funding and fixed fixed fee rate to, to the export transactions. Um, and um, so that, that was kind of one, one advantage. And, and the second, second is that um, the government actually increased our regulatory limits, both on export side and domestic business. This partly took place already prior to, to COVID-19 crisis. But, but this gives us a necessary headroom in terms of, of capacity. And um, I would next give a few comments, uh, kind of a little bit how we see that that situation has developed. And um, in, the, in the first stage, we, we saw a large number of working capital applications from SME sector. So this is different uh, from Sweden, what, what Marie just told. And uh, we have provided almost 1 billion euros uh, to SME and mid-cap market since the beginning of, of this year, which is double as much as, as last year during the same period. So now we see that the volumes are decreasing um, from the peak in this segment. But on the other hand, um, the average size of the application in euros uh, start, to, start to increase. And... Um, we could say that, that we are now moving or we have moved already to the second stage of, 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 the, of the crisis. Our primary tool is 80% is guarantee uh, that is applied by a bank, but we also have a direct loan uh, instrument if possible, if needed for, 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 uh, for Finnish SMEs. And, um, what is new this time is that, that uh, Finvera provides working capital also for larger companies. We, we haven't done that earlier, uh, apart from, uh, from uh, working capital related to the, to the export transactions, but, but we haven't earlier provided working capital for, for general purposes. Now we do. Uh, our guidelines is, is currently that, that we can offer 80% uh, guarantee up to 30 million euros and uh, we are currently considering whether there is a need to review this amount. Um, at, at the moment, it seems that, that large companies, they, that they have a good access to funding, but uh, we would like to, of course, be prepared if the situation changes over the time. But this is still something, something to be seen. And um, in terms of export credits, uh, there has been some extensions of payment schedules um, obviously, especially in, 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 in the shipping side. And, uh, but I would say that our volumes of export guarantees has remained more or less the same. Uh, new long-term ECA transactions have, have been signed. Those are the transactions that we have been negotiating for, for a long time. But also, also new, new leads are, are, are starting up and, uh, and there are some signs of new demand but maybe we want to, to wait a little bit before making, making further conclusions. I would, I would say that um, the same thing as, 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 as Marie said, that uh, the ECA business is, is going on and, and we continue to see the new transactions and, and we might see, um, might see new, new, new deals and, and increase of, of transactions. We also, just like, like Sweden, we, we also provide um, a credit insurance uh, not uh, do, through through kind of uh, direct credit insurance scheme. Uh, we have seen um, s some increase of, of 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 the of the volumes, but but not 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 that much yet. We are prepared to 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 scale up, uh, but the time will show how how much this um, how how this will develop. But I will I will hand over uh, at this at this point and, and thank you. Okay, you see, thanks so much for those um, for those comments. Uh, perhaps a, a, a question, if I could direct to both uh, Marie and yourself um, on the topic of risk appetite. So I took a note earlier that I think Birgitta mentioned some challenges with um, obtaining cover for some of the tied commercial loans. I'm just wondering if if 
a lot of the discussion has been about the pushing of liquidity into the domestic um, corporate base and you know very interesting to hear how um, strongly those facilities um, have been drawn upon but I wonder if you could talk about risk appetite and whether um, appreciating you know your role as government institutions to, to play a, a key function in this time um, whether any of your processes for reviewing transactions for considering risk have adjusted at all so perhaps I could go to Marie first with that if that's okay. Uh, yeah, uh, yes. just gonna start my video. Yeah. Thank you, Marie. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> well, uh, well, we haven't changed really anything when it comes to uh, our risk appetite or our risk assessment. We, um, I mean, we we have seen that certain we have been more reluctant to issue new guarantees to certain sectors in certain countries. But that is nothing, it's the same sort of risk assessment and we do as rigorous risk assessment as always. So mm -hmm. there is no change there really. Okay. And you see, could you perhaps just comment on that same thing? I mean, do you, do you see any ch additional challenges there? No, I would say that the, yeah, the, the, the process has, has remained more or less the same and, and uh, we evaluate the risks uh, with, with the same parameters as, as earlier. Uh, one, one, one thing that has changed is that we created a fast track for, for the smaller credits. I mean, and now I refer to the, to the uh, uh, loans or, or guarantees for SME sector in Finland less than 1 million euro or up, up to 1 million euro. So we created fast track for those. So that is maybe, maybe something that, that uh, a change that could be mentioned at, at this point. Okay. And, and Marie, have, I, sorry, please. Yeah, we had a similar uh, change in the processes. Our board normally meets every month, but now they actually meet every week. Wow. So since mid, since sort of end March, beginning of April, the board has met every week to make decisions in all these working capital guarantees. Okay, that's, that's, that's very interesting. And then on the coming back to the point of liquidity, Marie, that you've been able to put into the large corporate sector, um, not you know, not as you said, not just making the facilities available, but actually seeing significant utilization of those facilities. Do you have any comments as to um, yeah, as to why that might be? I think we would we would typically yeah, apart from the obvious, we would typically see the large corporate sector with large, for example, standby revolving credit facilities that would, would provide them with those features and that ability to draw in these particular times. Um, is it are you seeing both of these facilities being drawn? Are you seeing a preference over the facilities that that you provide? Do you think there's a cost differentiation at all? No, I think I um, mean the, there's uh, the, the demand has been for the long term uh, loans facilities, mm -hmm. and I think what, what one um, one interesting aspect here is normally in, for our business we see mainly international banks as our guarantee holders. Mm -hmm. Like in all export credit, is like I would say like ninety five nine between ninety five and hundred percent international banks. Wow! But here we see uh, uh, the Nordic banks are, uh, are the banks that actually are financing large okay. Swedish corporates. And I think one aspect could be that these amounts are huge. So there's of course also an interest from the Nordic banks to, to, to uh, what do you say, um, share some of the risk with the again. Mm -hmm. So that could be one of the reasons why there's a huge interest. It's the actual interest from the banks. Okay, okay. Great stuff. Well, I'm sorry to draw it to a close there, but trying to keep a, a track on time, I can see that there are some questions coming in. So I'm sure there'll be Great. some more stuff to reflect on later. So we will um, now move forward um, with our next session, um, which is entitled Guarding Against Compliance Threats. Um, as you can, I think for most people these days, there's a huge amount um, that's vying for our attention but of course, it's important that we don't drop the ball with the fundamentals um, in the meantime. So we are delighted to have today Matty Malmanen, who's Vice President for Trade and Export Finance within Trade Compliance at Kona Crane. So we welcome Matty. And also Antti Niemela, who's Head of Transaction Banking for Large Corporates and, and Institutions at the OP Financial Group. Um, so gentlemen, if you'd like to switch on your, um, your, your microphones and your videos, and we'll hand over to you. Hello. 
Can you hear me? Very good. Hear you well. Very good. Yes. Well, thank you. It's great to be here and involved with this GTR webinar. And uh, uh, very happy to talk about Know Your Customer with uh, COVID reflections and how it uh, turns out and how it looks. Uh, like you mentioned, we're going to have this session with Matti Malminen, who has great expertise around this topic. Hey, Matti. And uh, we will, um, first the question is why uh, know your customer and COVID is t current issue. Why this know your customer, which is important in, in any time, is more important now than it was before. The short answer would be that uh, uh, these exceptional times have increased the risk in supply chains. We have, have uh, we've seen that uh, supply chains are, are uh, turning slower. Uh, they are slowing down uh, because of the lockdowns. And we see that deliveries uh, are not going as fast as they, they have been. One customer mentioned uh, some time ago that supply chains are broken. Uh, they're not broken, uh, but there's certainly slowdowns. And this actually reflects to the uh, cash flows of the businesses. And as we heard from Maria and Yussi about the liquidity, at the same time, the market has been acting funny, uh, which means that the, the liquidity has been tightened than before, which of course reflects to the company's uh, uh, cash flows and, and liquidity positions. Uh, and of course, it has impact on the credit risk part. Maybe the third point would be that the fraud uh, situations have increased. Uh, we see from different authorities, Europol and, and from US, and, and uh, we see uh, statistics which, which tells that, that there are lots of, uh, 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 there are more fraud situations than before. That's, that's uh, something that we also see uh, at the bank perspective, and I'm sure you can add to this later on, Matti, as well. But uh, that's something, that's something uh, uh, which we can see. Now we come back to the uh, know your customer. The thing is that if the know your customer uh, process is in place, you are able to uh, decrease these or miti mitigate these risks at your, your businesses. So that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, I think uh, there should be a slide from us, a little teaser, and I will hand over to Matti at this yes. point. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Antti. And uh, thank you also, Matthew. And it was nice to see you. We have been doing quite a lot uh, together in the, in the past. And actually, broker and, and underwriters are in a very important position now when we have this um, COVID-19 situation. And also, it has a reflection to the KYC. If we get an insurance, uh, the insurance company has done a proper KYC and we can be in a good um, situation ourselves. A uh, couple of words uh, about uh, this KYC. I mean, when I, when I started uh, at Conecrens 10 years ago, quite soon after that, the, the bank started to, you know, do this uh, KYC inquiries and it was quite a pain, pain to get every day those uh, uh, forms and questionnaires from different banks. So I treat the KYC as a swear word. It, it, I mean, we are a stock listed company and uh, in 50 different countries. So we were really having a headache on this. But now I have changed totally my mindset. I, I think that KYC is a fantastic thing. And I'm really a lover of, of KYC when we do it on, on a correct uh, way. And, and I have stated to Conecrain sales forces all around the world that uh, we can make a lot of money. We can make a lot of, lot of money when we do a, a, a proper uh, KYC. Uh, in Finland, we had a, quite a big scandal a uh, few, few months ago, and this has also helped a lot 
uh, Finnish companies and uh, Finnish companies management to understand that how, why, why the KYC is so important. We had a government uh, purchasing uh, company or government uh, purchasing department who was ordering these masks and uh, they, they were doing this in a very fast uh, manner in a fast situation without doing any KYC and then it turned out later that these suppliers were partly criminals and and they had partly huge financial problems and and this has really awakened a lot of eyes uh, among Finnish Finnish companies. Uh, I would like now if you can turn on the next uh, slide because uh, to put this to the practice I, I, I decided to give you uh, Conecrain's internal uh, slide. This is our uh, slide which we give to our sales guys about you know the, the main bullet points concerning know your customer and why we are doing it and, and what are the most important things uh, I have in mind. Well we in our uh, credit policy we have really stated that uh, we need to know the background of our customer and we also need to use the uh, third party to support us. So we are using actually third party to give us so-called long comprehensive credit report where we can see a lot of lot of information. On top of this by the way we have an integrated tool uh, between Conecrain's SAP uh, and, and then the third party, actually German supplier. So every time automatically when we make an order to the SAP, when we make a uh, shipment to the SAP, it will uh, uh, automatically check if any of the party in this order or in the shipment is in any of the sanctioned list. And if that's the case, then it will uh, block, uh, block the order immediately. So we, we are using a lot of third parties to support us. For, we have of, of course a lot of uh, service customers, we have a lot of spare part customers and it doesn't make sense to you know have this 100 page credit report for small service customer but we need to check if they are sanctioned or not. So then, then this uh, German system works very well for that. We only need for, for smaller customers, we have a light version, which means that we check that the customer exists and is not in any sanction list. For, for all major transactions, we take the credit report. It's re important that we file uh, this information. We have already had cases where the authorities uh, have been asking that, hey, uh, can you show the, the uh, KYC papers of this and this customer? So, so it's very important that you have it in the safe place. Uh, and of course, uh, to our uh, units, we say that if you take the credit report, you have to read it uh, and, and understand it. Uh, so don't just take it for the sake of good order. Okay, I have taken the report, uh, I can tick the box. No, you have to read it. And uh, sometimes, like many of you know, they, they are a little bit yesterday's news. So uh, we also encourage our people to search from all, sort, all sources in the internet. So Google is a very good way of, of checking your customer. Take a look of a couple of first pages in the Google. And if they have had a scandal, it will definitely be found there. But of course, you have to be careful with this information. And then, in the old school times, I mean, our sales guys were always saying that they cannot make those questions from their customers. They think that it's an insult. But now the world has changed totally. It's totally okay nowadays that we, you can ask questions from your customer or you can ask questions from your supplier. And this is not what we are now encouraging our sales guys that, hey, come on guys, or, or our procurement guys. Now you can ask a lot of questions. You can interview your customer. And, and when, when, you can, uh, when you get information, make a s small memorandum and, and, uh, and ask about what is the present situation. And especially now, if you ha have the credit report and it has 2019 or 2018 finan financials, of course, what has happened now during this first half of 2020 might have changed the picture totally. So that's why you have to make a question. How are you doing now? And, and perhaps do some other like Sherlock Holmes work to find out how they are doing. 
and uh, I, I have also said that when you do the KYC, it gives you some, uh, you know, sales planning and, and also a good impression that you know how, how the buyer is doing. That's my, my uh, sort of uh, bullet points for this subject. And, and then we can later move on now to the how to make money with KYC. But let's turn on to Antti. Okay, uh, thank you, Matti. Uh, can I, Sam, get the next page, please? Uh, this is the last page that we have. Uh, we, have we had a, in the beginning kind of a statement or, or a teaser that know your customer is source of, of competitiveness. First, you referred Matti to the first uh, bullet point here or the eye picture here, stating that, uh, that uh, when you have a straight through, uh, through clear process, uh, uh, you can do things, things uh, uh, more efficiently. That was, that was one of the uh, statements that you, you were making and referring. Uh, the other thing is, is that uh, uh, when uh, you have understanding about the company, what they do, your customer or your supplier, you are able to uh, uh, child, uh, choose your uh, financing instruments or trade financing instruments to the, uh, to the uh, uh, occasion meaning that at some point you can mitigate your risk and at some point you can use straight financing uh, to get the business and get the deal. Is that correct, Matti? Do you see that same way? Exactly. Exactly. Yes. yes. And uh, of course, uh, there are times when you don't have to buy uh, the trade financing products. You can, when you know that the customer is solid and you have the financials there in place. And the third, uh, part is decreasing, decreasing the fraud risks. Uh, we, we do see uh, uh, when, we, when we know how the uh, supply chain is working and how the, uh, the practices are, are in place, when we know the customer, we are able to detect that these uh, new bank account numbers or these processes are not what they are normally doing. And, uh, and that is actually something which is the first line of defense when you find out uh, that your customer or supplier is asking to change things which have been placed previously and which is not common to that customer. And that's something that, uh, that is the first line of, of, of seeing that there's something funny going on. Uh, this is actually, this is Antti actually what we have seen at, at the connect cranes and I have heard also some other companies but also in our company I mean these fraudsters and hackers they if they see in the emails that somebody is mentioning the invoice or, or something mm -hmm. like this they, they try to you know steal the uh, uh, email and and we have seen several uh, attempts that they say that hey we have changed our account number and we have a rule at connect range that if somebody is telling that they are changing the account number uh, our business unit has to uh, call them by phone and uh, i mean the reliable person and ask that uh, are they really changing now the account number yes yes so uh, uh what you're saying is that uh, this is something you have to do. You have to do the know your customer procedure, but you can actually make money by doing it correctly. And, uh, and uh, one thing I have to add at this point is also what Birgitta was, was referring was the sustainability uh, part of it. That uh, if you, and when you know your customer and the supply chains, you are also able to ev evaluate whether the let's say ESG criteria are met and, and what is the process and, and that actually uh, knowing your customer and doing the procedure as well will help on that perspective as well. Yeah, I, Antti, I think that we have one more minute or something like this. So I would like to give my like a final statement about this issue and, and, uh, and then, then you can have your last um, comment about that. I think that there are certain uh, very good uh, instruments uh, what we can use now and what has been very valuable now during this uh, uh, COVID-19 situation. Of course, confirmed LC, fantastic uh, for, for this situation. 
And now uh, when we have digital, digital trade finance uh, instruments, we can handle those wherever we are. We can issue guarantees from a summer cottage uh, when we have multi-bank systems working. So, so that's very uh, important. Credit insurance, whether it's our ECAs or whether it's a private markets, that's also very important. When you have a big project and you are uncertain how the customers might uh, handle their, their, their project, uh, I mean, take a credit insurance that will definitely uh, uh, support uh, you. So, and like I said in the beginning, uh, when you have a bank confirming the LC, there has been two banks who have done the KYC, issuing bank and the confirming bank. And when we get an insurance policy from insurance company, they have definitely done the KYC. So that's why, for example, we in some of our business units, uh, Germany, France and US, uh, we are having even whole turnover policies. That's uh, my, 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 my uh, takeaways or, or my statement today. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. I think we can hand it back to Matthew. Um, so, um, Antje and Matty, thank you so much for that. Also, appreciate the plug for credit insurance. It's very welcome. That's good stuff. Um, again, a, an awful lot to, to chew on there. I think certainly we, we'll move on because of time. But I think, you know, question-wise, I can see um, people being interested to understand a bit more in these current times the actual correlation between what's happening out in the world at the moment and and any increase in, in in fraud risk and what might be driving some of that activity but hugely helpful so thank you so much um, so moving on now we go to our final panel um, which is entitled adapt and overcome and again we're great we're, we're hugely um, pleased to be able to welcome Beatrice Vassing who's the head of transaction banking sales and implementation within Handels Banken and, and last but by no means least uh, Jaco de Jong who is global head of sales for Bolero um, representing I guess broad you know their own business but also the digitization and the the technological angle um, that, that, that has a role obviously a significant role to play in these current times so perhaps Beatrice if we could um, turn to you first um, you might be kind enough to give us your thoughts maybe how you're seeing demand um, impacted and, and how you're responding to these current times mm -hmm. hello everyone um, yeah I think I'm going to start with quoting one of my colleagues actually he said something really smart the other day uh, it feels like the last four months we've been on a roller coaster and some of us have gone down and some of us have gone up on the same train. And I think it was a very good way of sort of describing the situation that we've been in. Um, we think that we've been back to normal if we look at the, in general in the Nordics since a month back. But of course, in some business areas, which we've also heard before, markets have really picked up and we're seeing all time high figures in even in some industries. Uh, but we're still, while still uh, retail is, is suffering a bit, uh, but that was already sort of hit a little bit before um, the crisis as well. So um, pretty much back to normal. And, and if we're looking specifically at trade finance, if we compare to other economies in other parts of the world, I think uh, the corona pandemic hasn't had as, as much impact or effect within the Nordics, uh, if you compare. Um, and there was a survey released the other day by the Chamber of Commerce in Finland, which actually showed that only 10%, I think, of the corporates experienced issue with, uh, issues with trade finance. Uh, and those were mostly evolving around shipping routes, logistics and, and currency rates. Uh, so maybe a little bit apart from Norway, um, we think that in, in general in the Nordics, we're, we're sort of back to a normal stage. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much for that, um, Beatrice. Um, could you just comment at all on you know, the role that you're playing within the supply chain and trade finance, um, particularly, I guess, in the context well, for the export business, how you are, um, how you're being affected from, again, from a risk appetite perspective? Are you maintaining the same levels of appetite, for example, when it comes to emerging market financial institution risk? Are, are, is any of your thinking or do you see a changing thinking at all within the banking market? Mm -hmm. uh, I think I agree a little bit with Marie there. Um, in, in general, I think banks in, in the Nordics are quite risk aware and we have good ways with working with risks since before. 
So I think the risk appetite or the risk profile hasn't really changed among the banks. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more towards looking into specific processes, like it was really important to get access to liquidity and the speed was, was very, a very critical factor in the beginning of the crisis. So we were very fast to respond to that within, amongst the banks and, mm -hmm. and very fast with coming out with new digital solutions for uh, corporates and smoother administration for our branches, for example, that ha handles uh, the financing requests. But again, I wouldn't say that it's specifically related to trade finance, it's finance in general. Um, and there are, of course, other things that we've been doing in, uh, in Sweden, for example, where we've had checklists that we've used uh, and sent out to corporates in order to, to, to look at their business. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there are things that we've done, but I think the risk appetite is, is more or less uh, the same. Okay. Um, and of course, in, in the, amongst the Nordic banks also, I mean, we've had quite good uh, capital uh, situation and we have access to liquidity. Um, there were a lot of corporates that, of course, had a need to draw on backup facilities and the cost for funding during a while went up as well. Uh, but I think we managed uh, pretty good. Um, okay. Maybe you, you could view this also as a stress test for, for the banks and the insurance companies and the ECAs. Um, where I think it, it has worked well, but there are, of course, things that could be done better. Um, and uh, that's a question that we need to ask ourselves, what could we do better in the future? Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much, that Beatrice. Hugely helpful. And um, perhaps turning to you, Yako, if we may, um, perhaps you just give us a sense of the impact for you for digitization with what's going on. Have there been opportunities that have come from here? If I could just quickly introduce that comment by saying um, for, our, for our, our, our business on the execution side, um, not just within credit and political risk, but the broader group of products within our business, we're now doing something like 95% of execution through one platform or another that can be done. So obviously hugely impactful um, for the trade for the trade finance community. Um, welcome your thoughts. Yeah, and thanks for inviting me to speak, uh, Matthew. Really enjoy it. So um, let me indeed give you a bit of background on what we have seen from a Bolero perspective. And basically, I'll also tie up a few of the comments that have been mentioned before by other speakers and try to link it all together in my, in my little section here. Um, so what we have seen from a Basically, from a Bolero perspective, what we do is we, we link the, what we always call the physical supply chain to the financial supply chain. So we have um, corporates who use our tools to, for instance, apply for LCs and apply for guarantees or get them advised and, and you know, have a centralized way of handling these transactions. But especially we've seen an impact on the actual utilization of these transactions. So what COVID has made um, crystal clear is that paper can get stuck around the globe. Um, you know, some countries are still totally in lockdown. Uh, India is still an issue. Uh, Algeria is still an issue where documents just don't move. So at the banking side, we have had banks that, um, you know, clearly their so-called BCP uh, uh, structures fell over, their business continuation processes fell over because the documents either could not reach the bank or it was very hard for people to check documents remotely. Um, even if they got to the banks. Um, but also what we noticed is that actually the documents around the physical shipments, even in the open accounts space, you know, they just could not get from the carrier to the exporter, from the exporter, let's say to a bank or maybe even directly to the buyer. So what we have seen um, an, an, a big impact from the COVID-19 uh, um, uh, situation is that there's an increased demand for the use of digital documents and the use for e-presentations. Interestingly enough, um, of course, you know, also the crisis hit global trade. Yeah, the first effects we noticed was indeed in March, where suddenly we saw, you know, uh, carriers like Evergreen, uh, who we work closely with, between the month of February and March, the number of e-bills of lading issued quadrupled, so four times as high. Um, then again, we didn't see that increase in e-presentations under bank transactions, like you know, uh, using uh, uh, LCs under the EUCP, for instance. So that tells us that these documents have been used under open accounts, cross-border transactions. Um, what you now see happening from our perspective is that banks have noticed that, have noticed increased demands from their clients to be able to support electronic presentations and use of EBLs. 
Um, so we now see that banks that we have been talking to for a long time now suddenly say, yeah, because of the BCP part, uh, yes, because of you know our clients have now shown more interest in e-documents and e-presentations, we need to start moving forward. Another, um, so that was definitely what, what Patrick Secker said earlier today, the documents got stuck and that sort of um, increased the, I would not just say awareness, but you know, increase the, 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 the realization of, you know, paper can get stuck and maybe this is then the, 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 the final push that the trade finance industry needed to move away from paper eventually in, at least for the trade finance transactions. Another element, um, again, to touch upon what has been mentioned before on fraud, um, uh, for instance, on invoices and then saying, you know, please pay it at a different account, is the many discussions I actually have with the banks are also fraud related right now, why they're more looking into digitization also in relation to COVID-19. Because as always, in, when there's stress in economies globally, when there's, you know, risks are going up, you know, fraud will uh, increase, right? People will become more creative and, and, and that will happen. So from the banking side, I have two angles that I talk about is one thing, um, we've seen a few recent um, scams with, you know, double financing and, 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 you know, the traders have become a bit creative, you know, on how to um, uh, try and get multiple financing from multiple banks on, you know, the same uh, type of cargo. So that's from a bank perspective. They are now looking more into EBLs as pledged um, and, and, and in relation to pledging that as collateral for financing. And then they know if it's an EBL pledge, they are the single pledgee holder. So that's one angle. But also on the other side, you know, we now see that some um, processes, again, COVID related, have gone into, you know, workarounds where um, instead of sending the documents around in paper, uh, on paper, in via DHL, UPS, they now send them around via email. And then it's easier to, you know, to, 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 to capture those documents and indeed, for instance, change account numbers. So from that perspective, also, if you like from a Bolero perspective, if you use a secure network to exchange documents, the risk of fraud and documents being tampered with, you know, becomes much lower as well. So we see various elements why things are now changing, why digitization is suddenly creeping up on the agenda uh, much quicker with banks and corporates than ever before. And then there's the last element, of course, is that um, because the documents got stuck around the globe, now governments and also organizations like, for instance, the Grain Council is now actively promoting to its, pan to, to its members like, you know, we have to move away from these paper documents, even, you know, e e phytosanitary certificates, always a diff difficult word to say, um, are now, you know, going uh, towards uh, becoming digital. So I think um, from our perspective, the, the, the major impact of COVID-19 has been that suddenly digitization in trade has, you know, really gone up the agenda with the corporates as well as the banks. Okay. Jaco, huge helpful. Thanks so much for that. Um, Beatrice, coming back to you, um, I mentioned a comment earlier about not grip, you know, losing grip of um, fundamentals despite the number of challenges and things vying for our attention at the moment. Um, the topic of ESG um, sustainability has been touched upon already. Could you let us know how, how you're sort of working through those challenges and opportunities at the moment? Um, well, um, I, I think in under, do, under normal circumstances, this is of course very vital for, for all enterprises, if you look into the Nordics, to incorporate uh, ESG and sustainability into their future and, and into their business. Um, mm -hmm. I think during the pandemic, though, it has been sort of a, a secondary issue for our corporates. Um, production and labor has, more, has been more important to, to overcome and, and to look into. But this is, of course, a priority. And, and I think all banks in, in general are working very hard with, with uh, um, green bonds and loans where we have a, a good infrastructure and a standard in place. So I think it will be interesting to, to see uh, in the future how we can manage to get uh, also a standard for trade finance by building different networks with local, um, uh, local uh, partners and new ways of transporting goods and especially in development countries. Um, I think it's good that we have international rules now issued by ICC. Um, and I think also, of course, if you look into the technology part of this, 
it, it, it is of course vital to get the data uh, related to how you measure that you're actually sustainable in order to get preferable pricing or individual mm -hmm. pricing of, of supply chain financing solutions, for example. So that's, uh, yeah, I, I think a lot is going to happen here. And especially after the pandemic, where we also will see, I think that buyers and suppliers are also driven more towards achieving uh, um, digital solutions. And that's also part of being sustainable, of course. So okay. very and, interesting and to follow. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. And Jaco, does, <clears throat> do, your, do your facilities, your systems have a role to play in that? Yeah, so the, the, the comments we get, and I totally ag agree with Beatrice that it's gone down the agenda a bit at this moment because many of the corporates are, of course, in survival mode and making sure that they can sustain their business, which is also a form of sustainability. Mm -hmm. But in general, if you look you know, at, at the amount of paper that is flying around in terms of documents under global trade finance transactions, you know, it's, it's, it's huge. So, and it's one thing, you know, that the paper needs to be produced, of course, that's one thing, but also, you know, it has also has to be transported by couriers, by, by planes and what have you. And in this day and age, you know, with everything being digital and everything being on portals and platforms and what have you, it's still a bit strange that we still rely globally on all these papers flying around uh, asset, you know, being produced and having to be shipped around. You know, the goods have to be shipped around, no question there, but really do we need those papers to fly around the globe as well? Um, I think that's becoming more of, more of a relevant topic with uh, many parties. Okay, okay. Well, um, Yako and Beatrice, thanks so much for those comments. I can't believe that we've come to the end of our fourth panel already, um, but we still have some time. So we're just going to enter into a period of um, Q&A now. And I've got several things that have been sent through to me on the WhatsApp by the team at um, GTR. So I'll just take these really as they come. Um, <clears throat> this is a question, I think, largely directed to um, EKN, but also to Finvera, so to Marie um, and to Yussi. Um, and the question reads, does it worry um, you that Sweden seem to be the only country, Sweden and Finland seem to be the only countries in the OECD who have decided not to support trade credit for the short term through reinsurance of the trade credit insurance system um, and maintaining um, cover at this level. This means a massive disadvantage um, for Swedish and Finnish exporters that cannot be compensated um, or by the you know case by case program that EKN has decided on. I, obviously, there's a reference to some of the fairly well publicised government su support schemes um, for the actual uh, commercial credit insurance market, if you like. So I wondered, and um, perhaps Marie, I see you very kindly popped up on screen already if you'd be kind enough to provide some comments in that respect yeah thank you well ikian has been in in a dialogue with the private risk insurance companies of course and we we realize a challenging challenge they are facing however um even though we would like to have a similar reinsurance programs we cannot because of the regulations that we that governs ikian so ECAN is not the, the, the right state support agency. Uh, rather, it would be other agencies like Rick Yeldon or others. Of course, we are worried, but one should be aware that the private risk insurance market of Sweden is fairly small and not as important as it is for other countries. And hopefully, I mean, we are also digitalizing digitalizing our business and trying to be make it more efficient so we can we are prepared to support Swedish uh, companies with a trade in in the EU, EU. Mm -hmm. so I'm not that worried but I understand the challenge that the private risk insurance companies are facing okay, okay and I, th I talked to you see Finland has a similar situation they are unable to, to have such programs due to the regulations that are governing Finland okay as well. Thank, thanks, Marie. Th thanks so much for being back on that. Um, now, the next question um, is is fairly broad, and I think a number of people could potentially respond on this. But it says, with the end of COVID, COVID um, not anywhere in sight, do you see the Nordic region closing up and the focus more on regional than international trade? I think it might be um, good potentially from the corporate side, um, maybe to get Matty's um, view on that, and perhaps we could turn back to um, Patrick um, for the for the finances response on that. So, Matty, would you be able to give us your your thoughts on you know uh, you know retrenchment into home markets versus um, versus the export market? Um, yeah, good question. But I think that this wouldn't make any change 
with Connecranes because we have such a small portion of our business in the home markets. Mm -hmm. It's all uh, outside of, of uh, Nordics and so on. So I don't uh, predict any change uh, after the COVID uh, concerning this issue. Okay, and perhaps um, Patrick, if you'd be kind enough to comment you know, in your dialogues, uh, perhaps with a broader corporate client base, do you have any sense of sh you know shifting patterns of trade? Um, I, I think we need to remember. Um, I think that we have a responsibility here uh, to drive the sustainable uh, trade pattern. Uh, however, we should not forget that currently. Um, Given the oil prices, the, 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 there is um, there is very it is a very big advantage currently to produce energy using oil. Um, so we are in a backlash here, um, which we need to be aware of. But but I think long term we are all aware of that this is the track you know the 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 track we need to go down. And there is a huge awareness. Uh, uh, in the industry uh, and and also in the banking environment, that this is important. But I wouldn't say that Corona has helped us here, given the development of the oil price. But there will be um, a, a turnaround here, is my expectation, and we will uh, continue to stress the emphasis of or, or emphasis that that uh, this is this is uh, not sustainable, not to go down this path. Okay, Thank, thanks for that, Patrick. Um, I've now got a question, interestingly, from an, an, an underwriter in the commercial market, and they're interested to know if there are any countries um, slash emerging markets that you specifically see becoming more difficult operationally. Um, any other countries with specific operational difficulty, African markets of particular interest. Um, I guess the, 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 the point here being that with the practical implications um, of, of COVID, as we've already heard, we've looked at um, the disruption to supply chains, but I can imagine there's another element to that, which is how that might manifest um, in, at an individual contract level, whether um, with regards to delays or challenges on payment. So I think perhaps most appropriate for that one, um, I guess perhaps Bagita, I don't know if you could comment um, on, the, on the financing side um, within uh, SEK, and perhaps again, maybe even Marie coming back to you, um, just to understand whether, you know, again, in the underwriting portfolio, whether you're seeing, you know, notifications with respect to particular markets of any particular challenges. So maybe if I could um, pass across to Marie and, and Bogita with that one. Ah, oh, there she is. Very yeah, prompt. well, I, no, I can, <laughs> I can start uh, just saying that uh, uh, we see some uh, problems actually in the Latin American countries. Okay. Of course, partly because some other Swedish uh, corporates have uh, manufacturing in, in, in Brazil, for example, and the factories have been locked down. And com countries like Colombia is completely locked down. You cannot make any payments and there are huge problems there. So Latin okay. America is, is, is where we see the major. And, that, and, that's, and that's, I guess those comments, they're very much focused towards the supply side of things. Both, both okay. I would say. Okay, okay, all right, thank you. And perhaps, Bagita, if you'd be kind enough to give us your thoughts. Oh, I think you're on mute, Bagita, sorry. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, when it comes to markets where we've seen some challenges to, to close transactions, well, then we are back, I think, to, to the African continent. And there, are, there have been some delays in some transactions due to lockdown and due to the inability to actually travel there and finalize the signing of contracts and also uh, signing of, of loan agreements. So uh, yeah, there have been some challenges there. Okay, okay, that's very good. Um, so I think I've got another question here on sustainability, but I think we've probably covered that. Well, I'll ask the question and just open it up to everybody in case anybody particularly wants to comment. Um, and I know, Birgitta, funnily enough, you did touch on this briefly. Is there an expectation that in the post-COVID era, there will be a stronger push and interest in sustainable trade? So perhaps your thoughts there. Absolutely. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> there, is an, there is an expectation that that will be the case. And I think... Uh, that's also something that uh, the Swedish export credit system will work very hard on and, 
and hard for and we uh, well i have lots of expectations there okay all right well look, i think we've um if i'm judge my clock correctly we've come to the um the end of our time um so it really just leaves me to firstly thank all of the panelists um for their for their contributions both in answering questions and all of the preparation work that they've done today um thank you to all of you that have taken the time to dial in have an interest in the nordic market and and also ask questions and last but not least a huge thanks to the guys at gtr um, for making the arrangements and facilitating today um, we hope that you found this very useful um, we'll leave that there and we wish you a very good day goodbye for now